So welcome everyone to the first of the Health Fundamentals class. Uh, the Health Fundamentals series is actually a new series that we're launching. Uh, a lot of it actually I think is summed up in this quote. As to the methods, there may be millions and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. The man who tries methods ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. Very clear quote. How many people have heard of different methods? How many people have gotten a suggestion about uh, an exercise regimen that you should follow? Anybody? <laughs> Everybody? Yeah. It's kind of ridiculous. That's a method. They tell you, follow the method. Doesn't matter what it does. Follow the method because I do, or you should, because I think so. Not sure why. Not sure even what the principle is behind it, but it seems good. And see the people on the advertising, they're all looking, you know, the way I want to look, so I'm going to do what that is. I want, to let, I want to let you in on a little bit of a disclaimer on that one real quick. So um, in exercise advertising, the men are allowed to be fit. The women have to be lanky and almost falling <laughs> apart in order to be photographed in a way that is desirable to promote the product. I actually know this because I used to model in New York City. And the people that you would think are fit on the magazines could barely do a thing in the program that they're advertising. Wow. It's kind of ridiculous. Now, thankfully, these days it's changing a little bit. Just a little bit. You, you, we are allowing more of a tolerance for actual fit women. So finally you can be healthy and we can say, hey, that's something I actually want. But unfortunately for a long period of time, you're actually uh, you know, on a very low functional level promoting something that you can't actually live up to yourself. So I hope that changes soon. But anyway, uh, the Health Fundamentals series, what we wanted to do is go over some common questions to, uh, pertaining mostly to care, actually. How many people, if it's okay, how many people are patients here at the Pierce Clinic? Uh -huh. Most, most everybody. That's fine, that's great, actually. Because we get a lot of questions. We got questions about nutrition, exercise, which we're gonna talk about today. We get questions about emotions. You know, hey, um, is, it, is it an alignment issue or am I stressed out today? Can you help me out here? Emotions are pretty powerful. We get questions about the environment, how the environment affects us. Maybe something's in the air right now. Something's going on. You know, we live in the environment every single day. Sometimes we take it for granted. We also get questions about uh, the senses. You know, I'm not feeling things right. Sometimes it deals with something pertaining to advanced orthogonal care, but sometimes, sometimes it has to do with something else. Anyway, these questions, are, they became a little more uh, common, so what we decided to do is actually create classes and content around it to go over the principles behind these health fundamentals so that you can more clearly navigate the world around you, the advertising around you, the information around you, and make better and clearer decisions for yourself. Because if you're someone who knows principles, then you can successfully select methods that you would like to participate in in order to get a desired result. Not always the image of a desired result, but the inward expression or the outward expression of that health within, finally allowing it to come from the inside out and show and experience that health through your entire life. So today we're going to go over health uh, fundamentals pertaining to exercise and movement. Now, a little background about me. I'm actually, uh, I have a bachelor in exercise science. I concentrated my studies as an athletic trainer. So I worked with a lot, a lot of sports teams on rehab and injury prevention. Um, I studied everything I need to know uh, to become a personal trainer. I didn't pursue personal training, instead I went directly to chiropractic school. And from chiropractic school, I spent a lot of time understanding the patterns through the body, how they affected our health, how they affected our frame. Basically, I wanted to take a look at the human frame on a big scale, not losing any of the detail, but I wanted the overarching picture. What does it look like to be healthy? What does it look like to experience health? What is exercise 
in its bigger global definition. And I also wanted to know on the itty bitty micro scale, I want to know what's happening in the cell, what's happening in the nerves, what's happening in the muscles, but the little tissues, I wanted to know everything. So finally, after all these studies, I was able to get this pretty comprehensive idea. And I'll show you in a little bit, but I still kind of feel like I'm at a lack because sometimes the stories are more powerful than the science that can be. Anyway, uh, I do teach anatomy and physiology for yoga teacher trainings. Um, it is a program I, I created directly for yoga teachers. So the instruct I teach the instructors and the instructors teach people. And I want to make sure that we have very, very well-informed instructors. So they made very uh, clear decisions about how they would train other people in yoga. And of course, this material isn't yoga anatomy. There's no such thing. Anatomy is anatomy. An arm is an arm. It's not a yoga arm, you know. So <laughs> when, I, when I talk about that, I really just created an anatomy program, but pertinent to trainers. Um, and I st I'm actually doing my first one here in St. Pete. Um, and I'm excited about that, but I used to do that in California. My wife and I are actually um, running coaches. We haven't been doing it here, but in California, we were half and full marathon running coaches. So we had a, a lot of fun doing that. But basically, we were highly involved in the community when it came to uh, moving and exercise. And we just loved helping people get going. Because getting going is sometimes the hardest part. So 123-year-old man, when 50 years ago, so when he was uh, 73 years old, he goes, I can't be a hunter anymore. I'm going to farm. And he just farmed till he was 123. Amazing, isn't it? You just look at it. It's, it's jaw-dropping. This is why I love this article. It's so well, so well done. This woman here, this one was in the country of Georgia in the, I think it's Caucasus Mountains. Sorry, I'm not from the area, so I don't know what it's pronounced. Um, she's more than 130 years old here. She doesn't know her exact age, but she knows how old she was when she got married within a year or two and had kids and everything who are all above 102. Um, so she had like time frame references. So she was, it says she was somewhere between 130 and 137, but they couldn't lock down the actual year. So above 130. Um, sitting on the porch of her home, she was nudged into her re into retirement from her job as a tea picker two years earlier. So she was almost 130 and she finally retired from tea leaf picking. And five years prior to that, she was tea leaf ch uh, picking champion. I almost couldn't say that. Champion in her whole region. She was so fast at it at her age. You love this? Still active around the house. Miss mm -hmm. Lasuria enjoys a little vodka before breakfast and a daily pack of cigarettes. It's funny. It's funny. Here. I don't know. <laughs> there might be something to it. <laughs> Oldest living person? If Shiri, Shirali Nislimov was born in 1805 as a Soviet, uh, a Soviet genealogist maintained, he's now in his 168th year. That's r with records. This guy actually had records. They don't let him, any, nobody like p can't flood. They, the Soviet was protecting him completely because they were like, this guy is so old, we just want him to keep living. And he's like the oldest person in the, in the world. But this is awesome. Um, even though they can't uh, come into interview and he's too frail to travel, he still rides horseback and tends an orchard he tells of planting in the 1870s. And he says that he married his 120-year-old wife 102 years ago. They've been married a while. Getting along pretty well, I guess. <laughs> In this same article, I thought this one was awesome. Um, what was it? They, they asked a gentleman, are you old yet? He was over 100 years old. He was about 104. I said, are you old yet? He goes, I, I, was, I finally got old about 10 years ago because I lost my sexual activity at like 94. He's like, so I think at that point I hit oldness. He, like they don't have a concept like we have. We had like retirement where like you're officially old. They don't have it in their culture. So they just said, stuff's not working the same. I guess I'm old now, I guess. <laughs> he didn't really know. How about this guy? Fajwa Singh, Different, not the same article at all. 
This guy runs marathons. He ran marathons until he was 100 years old. His last marathon was 100 years old. This is his last race. It was a 10K in Beijing, I believe. And he's finally quitting running at 101. And he's fast. He's fast. So I guess age may not have everything to do with exercise and movement. Not just age. Tibetan monks, anybody ever seen pictures of Tibetan monks, some of their activities? They train quite hard and train very, quite rigorously. This is real. I actually had a professor who went up there, one of my professors in chiropractic college. He went to Tibet. He went up and climbed the mountains. He said that was hard enough. He gets up to the top and all these monks are training. He had pictures of them doing that, that he took. One finger handstands. They're so strong. That would break my finger. I'm working on it, but it would break my finger if I did that. And then, obviously, a headstand right here. Actual headstand. And they will hold that. Their bodies are so in tune and work so well that they can just maneuver as if it's nothing around anything. Stone, forest, anything. doesn't really matter. So all of these people display something. You can obviously see the older generation in, in uh, the Caucasus Mountains and in Ecuador. They have a lot of agility left. They're not sitting around, hunting to farming, tending an orchard, riding horseback, just retired from tea leaf picking. You have monks who just have phenomenal capability. Unbelievable. It almost looks like it defies everything about gravity that we know. And then you see an old, uh, an old gentleman who just runs marathons because he enjoys it. He's not fighting the pain. It's not no pain, no game, you know. So all of them must be following some sort of principles. And we hear a lot of them, like maybe they have strong hearts because they exercise all the time. Or maybe um, they are really, really fit. But they don't really have these qualities that we would look at when we think of extremely fit or exercise a lot. So we're going to go over a couple principles, only three, but three that I think will really influence a lot about the way you think about movement and exercise. Because you'll understand your body better. Okay. So number one, principle. Movement in the body creates tone. And when we think of a toned body, is this closer to what you would think if you just thought, like, what's toned look like? Is it closer or is it far? What do you, okay, describe what you think. This is, ex ex it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that kind of bullet in my life. <laughs> that's really weird looking. <laughs> okay. That's actually, that's actually like closer to non-steroidal. Steroidal gets crazy. <laughs> yeah, this is more, this is closer to natural actually. But it's not, it's okay. fitness for functionality. I know, mm -hmm. I know. We're starting with the extreme. We're working towards functionality. Yeah. Okay, so movement creates tone. What is tone? We have Olympic athletes. Would everybody agree maybe that Olympic athletes are relatively toned? Maybe? I would think so. Well, I'm doing. Yeah. But what is tone? I mean, we, you might think tone is seeing muscles, so you could see a six pack. Maybe it's looking good. You might think that just means like clean lines, angles, shape, something, you know. Muscle definition, maybe it's closer to it because you could see that there's tone in the muscle. But then what's that tone? When we say that's tone, can anybody describe it? Okay, let's go over it. Let me guess what you yeah, said, but not like extra, like fat on top of it. You see so less fat. Less fat. It's more toned. Yeah, not, yeah. Okay. So let's look at this definition. Muscle tone, which is residual muscle tension or tonus, is the continuous and passive partial contraction. I'm going to translate all this. Uh, of the muscle or the muscle's resistance to passive stretch during resting state. In other words, if I have tone, I don't, and I shook my arm, right? This would be no tone. It just flops around. I shake it, I can flop it. There's nothing resisting anything. Partial contraction. So it's not me trying to flex my muscles. I'm not trying to pick up the cabinet. I'm try not trying to do anything like that. But I have a partial contraction of my muscle. It just means that when I shake, there's some resistance. 
It doesn't flop. The muscles react to whatever comes their way. Okay? Let's look at this a little bit more. Uh, the reason I put these pictures, unbelievable extreme, definite steroids involved here. Is that tone, though? A child tends to be pretty toned, right? They never stop. They're always moving. And as soon as they're done, they crash and sleep. It's awesome. <laughs> and we've all been there. We've all been there. So there's something about tone. To understand tone better, we actually need to understand another principle. It's called tinsegrity. Okay? It's complicated. I'll walk you through it. Tinsegrity is defined as simply tensional integrity. Imagine you have a skyscraper built with I-beams, cement on the bottom, lots of rebar through it, then you put I-beams sunk down in there, huge beams at the bottom. As you get close to the top, you can use relatively smaller and smaller beams because the whole point of that structure is to resist downward compression. Does that make sense? So there's weight pushing down. So the bottom better be stronger because there's a whole lot more weight down there. The top is only resisting what's above it, so I don't need the same kind of structure. Tension is completely different. That's, that's resisting a compression force, so it's compressing down all that weight. A tension force is something that resists pulling. Okay? So whenever I... You could even think of... Uh, an elastic band. The harder you pull the elastic band, the closer to that end range you get, it gives more and more resistance. You bring it back in, it still has resistance because it never let go of its tension. It's still pulling either way, but it's resisting two hard parts, right? You think of a hand, if you grabbed it, hard part, hard part, tension in the middle. Our bodies are built with both. Here's the example. If I just stood here, Imagine my skeleton all the way through. My skeleton is resisting gravity pulling down on me. So the bones at the bottom are bigger than the bones at the top. We do have similarities to a structure like a skyscraper. Even the spine, the bones of the spine are bigger at the bottom, smaller at the top. Same principle. If you took a skyscraper and you lean like that, what will happen? Fall over. Fall right over. Why don't I? Muscles. Muscles. <laughs> Have you heard it before? No. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> so, I have something going on that resists both the compression forces of gravity pulling down and the tensional forces of me leaning over. There's a huge amount of tension going on here and in my legs in order to resist a lean. Where a skyscraper has no tension forces. They have no muscles, they have no bands to say, hey, if you lean over, we'll make sure that you don't go anywhere. It has nothing. It's a completely compression structure. We are not, we are totally different. So because of this, because of this, we actually have a much more dynamic capability. We have the ability to move freely through space and resist something that might come our way that we didn't know about. James, would you mind uh, coming up here real quick? James is going to example something for me. Or he's going to be my demonstration dummy. Not a dummy as an idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean. But if James is basically a stack of bones, has no tensegrity, no tone to the muscles, then any time he encounters a force, he will just succumb to that force unless it's straight down. So if he, very, very minimal things going on right now, if I push straight down, guess what? Decent resistance. That's pushing on the bones. The bones aren't going anywhere because those are compression structures. It's good for compression. As soon as I push him that way, he flops. It's just a little bit, he goes. If I push him in the waist, it gives easy because there's no tone actually resisting. There's nothing at the ready. But if he has this tensegrity, this tone in his body, then he's able to resist forces a little easier. There's give, there's give, but there's resistance. 
in multiple directions. So I can still push down, nothing's going anywhere, but it's not going. Even when I lift his arm, I feel some resistance. If I try to push him, I feel there's a response. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, you should be in push around. <laughs> we practice all the time. Well. Well, all the time. <laughs> so we have just a dynamic, dynamic body. We have these, this amazing skeleton. It's built so well. Has all these connecting points for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of muscles. 206 bones. Most of them have m multiple, multiple attachments. You have so many muscles in your body. So here we go. Compression structure. Gravity resists it. We move on. We have muscle. And when you think about the muscle, you can resist a lot of forces. And this is the way we normally think about it. Let's say you want to increase the tone of your body by exercising. Can we all agree, like if I started exercising, I exercised every day for a month, and I just did bicep curls, right? Bicep muscles. If, I, if you saw my arm, do you think that you'd be able to tell that I was working out, even if I waited like three days and didn't work out at all, three days after my last workout, would you be able to tell there was something going on where that muscle is relatively active in my body? Should be. Whether or not I'm lifting something at the time, there's, there's activity, it's evident, right? That's tone. It's evident that there's activity, that thing has something going on. So we think about it like that and we say, well, I want a toned body. So what do we do? We go to the gym and we go, I'm going to do legs. You do something with your legs. I don't know. You do squats. You start to increase the muscle. You do bicep curls. Got to work out that muscle. You do arm lifts. You do work out that muscle. You do crunches, that muscle, one at a time through the whole body. Finally, you go, that's tone and that's tone. And oops, I forgot that one. And that's tone and that's tone. You know, and you go, I have a problem area. I got to work on my problem area. I got to get it toned to match the others because we compartmentalize our body. So even when we get the concept of tone, nobody was lost on that concept. Tensegrity is just a big word to understand that we have resistance. But the reason I brought that word up is because we are not built in just a conglomerate of parts. We're not just like this piece here, this piece here, this piece here, work on each one, finally, everything. Oh, that's a little out of balance, bring it up. Good, finally got there. We're not built like that, not at all. We're built with these bands of fascia around all of our muscles. Now fascia is kind of like saran wrap, but it's living. So thankfully it's not just saran wrap, but it's, it's very resistant. And this fascia goes through the little fibers within our muscles, around our whole muscles, around groups of muscles and around whole uh, limbs. We have fascia just wrapping everything. And these bands go all the way through our bodies. And they actually take what we think is one isolated muscle that's very important and actually connect them as trains through a whole body so that that one muscle is actually um, greater when it works in the context of the whole that it's a part of instead of as an isolated part. Does that make sense? Let me show you. These are called anatomy trains. These are some of them. There was an anatomist who went through and he actually dissected cadavers and he started to take apart the body. And he was like, you know, most people, they look at the muscle. I'm, I'm just going to look at patterns. And you start to notice, hey, you know, we keep thinking that the muscle ends and so does the fascia that covers it. But the interesting thing is, is that that covering actually just keeps going and wraps around another muscle, keeps going and wraps around another one through the body. And so he goes, well, let me be careful here and start taking out the muscle patterns, the groups that are connected by continuous fascia, plastic wrap, you know. So he did, and this is what he found, that your body it consists of these unbelievable trains through the body. He calls them trains because if you think about it, it's like train car, train car, train car, train car, train car, all these isolated parts that are actually interconnected with links, which is the overlap of the fascia. And so that means that if I want to strengthen my calf muscle, my back muscle's involved. If you stood up, you actually have a tendency to rock backwards. You're engaging your back muscles. If I want to strengthen my pec muscle, my forearm is involved. A lot of our swinging motions, if you think about it, are long movements. 
when we are ga engage our bodies in full body movements, then we actually train that tone in its complete frame. And that's why I use the, the uh, idea of tensegrity, is you actually have a, an amount of tone that runs through your, enti sorry, your entire body that if you train as a whole part, a whole organ, a whole thing, that you actually gain resistance and tone in your whole frame and everything hangs better together. So then when you get the suggestions, and we talk about methods and principles, principles understand that my body's made to be used as a whole, everything. Think about it, a pitcher doesn't go, this muscle is good for throwing. It doesn't do that. Complete wind up, everything. I, I wish I had that one. There's a line that goes right across the body. It is literally like the pitching train. You swing one leg out, it literally, like an elastic band, stretches everything, getting it ready to just snap back. So you actually use your leg, using that anatomy train, you have this long, open train of muscles ready, just like a rubber band, snap back and whip. Their hand goes right to the other end of the train. They almost touch their foot every time. These trains are unbelievable. So when we think about movement, sitting there, pumping iron, like in a chair, if you think about it, like how ridiculous is it? I'm gonna work my abs, sit down, turn off all my leg muscles, and, and you're punching out at, uh, crunches or something like that. Your abs are completely involved in everything in the front of your body. You're missing out on half the fun and half the gain. Not just gain, but gain for your health. So this is my analogy, and this is how we're going to refer to it. Imagine if you had uh, a little base or a little forward operating base in the military, and you have soldiers on guard. You want those soldiers to be ready for anything that might come their way. What do you think happens if you have sleeping soldiers? A great amount of damage is done on the inside. Isn't that right? So this is our analogy, and this is how we're going to refer to it here. Your muscles, and especially the anatomy trains, are like soldiers on the edge of a base protecting you. You want your soldiers on the ready, don't you? If your soldiers, your muscles, and especially the trains of muscles, are on the ready because you've trained them well to operate together through your whole body, then anything that might come your way, anything you might encounter, you will be able to resist. Just like I showed you with James. I push him, there's resistance. That's good. If you have sleeping soldiers, if your muscles are not on the ready, then as soon as something comes your way, you're toast. That's when you bust a ligament, pull a muscle, you get hurt, you get bruised hard because you don't have the ability to absorb the shock and send it through your body. You're built like that. You're made to do that. But if they're not on the ready, if you have sleeping soldiers, you're probably going to encounter a lot of damage on the inside. Okay? So movement, healthy movement, creates tone and long trains through your body so your soldiers are on the ready. Okay? That's how we're referring to it. Next one. Movement prevents restriction. This one's super fun. And I have a video James hasn't seen, so if he goes, whoa, in the back, you know what it's coming from. <laughs> anyway, um, restriction. How many people have encountered restriction? Can't move quite right, can't move that far. Tried to reach up this way, and it just feels like things are pulling in awkward directions. Felt it before? How many people have tried to bend over and touch their toes, and they say, I used to be able to do that. <laughs> I've done that. So, if we move, we actually can prevent a lot of the restrictions that could come our way. But here's how. You have to understand the principles behind the way our body works in order to understand how to prevent the restriction that you've encountered before. So, we talked about fascia. Oh, man. That's the one that got messed up. I knew there was going to be one. This is fine because this is the picture we need. So, we talked about how we have muscles across the whole body. And there's fascia that cover the little bundles within a muscle around a whole muscle itself and then when you group the muscles together it wraps around the groups of muscles and then there's also fascia that goes around the whole limb keeping it all tight together right 
So we have these layers of saran wrap like stuff that should slide very easily across one another. They are supposed to be slippery, slippery, slippery. Okay? And when you feel that, that's when you go, man, I just feel so loose. Oh, yes. You know, have you ever had that moment where you just, like, you feel alive? Everything's working right. You're moving. Anytime in your life, you just, you're like, wow, I feel good. I don't feel anything in my body. Just slip and slide, and everything's great. After a good massage. After a good massage. <laughs> you're, you'll understand this well then. Anybody get a massage before? Everyone who's gotten a massage will understand what I'm about to show you. We're going to watch the fudge speech. Okay? This is awesome. What do I do? What's that? Okay. Okay, and. This is about five minutes, okay? Oh, there is cadaver kind of dissecting. If you don't like it, cover your eyes, but listen, okay? Yeah. So here's the thing about the fuzz. We're trying to do it at home. This guy's funny, by the way. So we see the fuzz. You can see it now. I'll put it in over my voice. The fuzz yields to my fingertip. Sometimes I come across a stronger, thicker strand. It doesn't yield to my fingertip. That represents older fuzz sometimes, or maybe it represents the nerve. But each night when you go to sleep, the interfaces between your muscles grow fuzz. It's slippery. And in the morning when you wake up and you stretch, the fuzz melts. We melt the fuzz. That stiff feeling you have is the solidifying of your tissues. The sliding surfaces aren't sliding anymore. There's fuzz growing in between them. You need to stretch. Every cat in the world gets up in the morning and stretches the body, and it melts the fuzz in the same way that the fuzz melted when I passed my finger through it. When you're moving, it's as if you're passing your finger through the fuzz, just like I did on the cadaver forum here. So you have to stretch and move and use your body in order to melt that fuzz that's building up between the sliding surfaces of your musculature, the sliding surface, those shiny white surfaces of the rectus femoris sliding against the vastus intermedialis. So these uh, sliding surfaces are all over your body, and the fuzz is all over your body, and as you move, you melt the fuzz. Now what happens if you get an injury? <coughs> my shoulder. My shoulder is stiff now. I'm holding my shoulder. I go to bed. I wake up in the morning. I don't stretch my shoulder. I'm afraid it hurts. So I'm wandering around like this. Last night's fuzz doesn't get melted. I go to bed, I sleep some more. Now I have two nights fuzz built up. Now two nights fuzz is more fuzz than one night's fuzz. What if I have a week's fuzz or a month's fuzz? Now those fuzz fibers start lining up and intertwining and intertwining and all of a sudden you have thicker fibers form. You start to have an inhibition of the potential for movement there. It's no longer simply a matter of going, oh, ah, stretch. Now you need some work. Now you might need to do a more systematic exploration of that place to restore the original movement that you lost. And usually this is the case. We have a temporary injury, then we restore our movement. But sometimes we call this aging. The buildup of fuzz amongst the sliding surfaces of our bodies so that our motion becomes limited, the limit cycles become introduced into our normal full range of motion, and we start to walk around like this. We're all fuzzed over. Our body is literally solidifying and reducing our range of motion in, in individual areas of our body and over our entire body in general. So I believe that one of the great benefits of body work, whether it be massage or structural therapies or uh, physical therapy or any kind of hands-on therapy, uh, these types of therapies introduce movement manually to tissues that have become fuzzed over through lack of movement, whether the lack of movement is because of an injury and a person is protecting that injury, or because of uh, personality expression. That was many years when I just walked around like this, so I was very still and monk-like. So, and then I became a little more dynamic in my personality when I realized what I was doing to myself and the kind of life that I wanted. So, you can grow fuzz by choice or by accident.
movement or whatever, and yet here, now you've heard the fuzz speech, you know that you can take responsibility for melting the fuzz, and if there's too much fuzz in your body and it's frozen up, you might want to seek help in order to produce movement so that the new cycle is a little more movement and a little more movement and a little more movement instead of a little less movement, a little less movement, a little less movement. Fuzz represents time. The easier it is for me to pass my finger through the fuzz, the less amount of time it's been there. If I gotta whip out my scalpel to dig my way through one otherwise sliding surface and another, you know that that's been building up for a long time. So you can actually see time in fuzz. That's the fuzz speech. <laughs> Exactly. Does it, it made me want to stretch. I know. It's hard to sit still when you know that's going on. Now, you named it. I don't know if they heard. What is another name for fuzz? Can anybody guess? You, I know you already said it. But. What was the title of that video? It's the fuzz speech. <laughs> this guy is brilliant. Unbelievably brilliant. If you want to learn anatomy, watch some of his videos. Is it the knots too that you get over time? Sometimes. Sometimes that can be muscle actually staying really tense to protect a joint. But over a long period of time, if it stays locked, what do you think it's laid down? Buzz. Buzz. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So, what's another name for fuzz? Does anybody know? From especially when he described it with an injury. So fuzz is scar tissue. Scar tissue. Or fibrous adhesions. You could call it either. If you think about it, you injure an area, first thing your body tries to do is lock it down. Can't go anywhere. Let me heal. Let me heal as best I can. I'm going to restrict it, rebuild some tissue, get some strength slowly as strength returns. If you've ever been to physical therapy, you know, oh, it's locked up. We'll both stretch it and strengthen it, but we don't want to stretch it more than the strength you have to resist whatever you might encounter. So only do things within the range of strength that you have, and we'll break up scar tissue little by little. They're breaking up fuzz. Can you do it little by little? You can, and you can do it aggressively sometimes too, very aggressively. Um, good story about this. I actually had a patient in California. His brother, brother, relative. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what uh, relations, but his relative was in Japan during World War II. His brother was shot multiple times with a, a gun from a plane, which are I mean, they rip you apart like that ripped his leg apart broke bone ripped through muscle everything he kept his leg it healed over what do you, how do you think he walked afterwards oh. kind of like right so they said why don't you come back to the US now he was actually Japanese so he he was a Japanese and American like he could have come back to the US <clears throat> He decided to stay in Japan and go to the judo instructors. You know what they did? Cranked his leg back and forth. He described it as the most excruciating time he ever went through. And guess how, when he arrived and his family was picking him up, guess how he walked? Completely normal. Completely normal. Fuzz has a purpose. Fuzz has a purpose for a time. We're not supposed to live every day with it. If we are, it's a pretty good signal that we're not moving the way we should. Let's look at this for one second because you'll get this. If the body lays down fuzz when there's a lack of movement and fuzz is also laid down after injury, using deductive reasoning, your body treats a lack of movement like injury. You are chronically injuring yourself by not moving every day. And it's the kind of injury that accumulates over time. So it only gets worse with time. 
A cut gets better with time. Lack of movement only gets worse with time. It's powerful to think about. The good news is you can undo fuzz. You can undo fuzz. It takes work. Yeah. If you have worked out your whole life for, yeah. for 20 years or so and then you stop working out, mm -hmm. like does your body make more fuzz or like how do your... Is it worse than those kind of people? This is, this is how wild it is. He described it well. You go to sleep, you get fuzz. You wake up, you stretch like a cat, no more fuzz. If you do it every day. You let it go for a while, a little harder to stretch out. Might actually take a little bit. Maybe you should, you know, build some heat, actually get some real good motion. Like, hey, you know, I haven't really moved for a, a week. Maybe I should do something a little more rigorous. A week can turn into two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, three months, a year. And I think you move later when you've been putting off finally getting active. And again, this isn't a method. It's not saying, so the best thing you should do is run. Period. End of story. Walk away. You know, like that's not what I'm saying. But the importance of movement in every way that you're made to move becomes all of a sudden extremely important. So it's not something you can accumulate like, oh, great, I'll work out twice as hard and then take a year off. No. Day one. Fuzz. Because it's a process that's always on. Why do you think your body can lay it down in an injury so fast? It's because it was never off. The process never stopped. You don't feel it while you're walking. It's kind of hard to lay down fuzz on something that's slipping and sliding real well. Stay moving, nothing to lay down on. Go to sleep, wake up, stretch, stretch, good to go. No fuss. But wake up, sit down. Go to work, sit down in the car. Arrived at work, stairs, yes. A little bit of fuzz gets broken up, sit all day. If you're sitting in that 1630 conundrum on the wrong side, then you will be accumulating fuzz, most likely 23 and a half hours of a day if you're an active person. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Movement promotes healthy function. We're going to fly through this one, but we're going to have some fun. Your body is made up of a multitude of systems. I actually wrote every one down. Different slide for each one, but we're going to talk about just different ways that movement helps the systems of our body. Real quick, okay? So you can understand that there's so many parts. And we understand the systems better than you would think you did. You don't need to be an anatomist anymore. Go ahead and name nine special t specialists. Nobody repeat each other. What's one specialist? Rheumatologist. Rheumatologist. Go. Cardiologist. Cardiologist. Hearts. Neurologist. What? Pulmonologist. Pulmonologist. Neurologist. Neurologist. Endocrinologist. Endocrinologist. <laughs> Name another. Chiropractor. Wait, what? Chiropractor. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hematologist. Hematologist. Urologist. Urologist. Pathologist. Pathologist. <laughs> what else? We're not done. You guys know that. <laughs> Gynecologist. There we go. They don't have one for guys, so it's just for the ladies. <laughs> what else? Orthodontist. Orthodontist. Yep, you got your teeth. Gastroenterologist. Gastroenterologist. There we go. Podiatrist. Podiatrist. Should we stop there? You've named almost every system of the body through the specialist that you have heard of or been referred to. You're not even an anatomist. You don't even have to read an anatomy book. You guys know this stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's run through it because it's not foreign to anybody. Circulatory system. Cardiologist, hematologist, right there. The system provides transportation for nutrients um, and oxygen to the body. It transports hormones from the glands to whatever the glands were sending the signal to. And it helps the chemicals uh, of the body. Oh, I'm sorry, hormones and chemicals. But it does eliminate waste. So we both provide the goods and get out the bad through the blood. So movement and exercise. Oh, I didn't update that one. Ignore that. Movement and exercise, how do you think it helps your heart and blood flow? It's not a trick question, so. Pumps more blood. Pumps more blood. With more blood, you get more nutrients in, oxygen in, gunk out, right? You get faster delivery of hormones. That means responses are faster, more at the ready, 
It doesn't have to do with your muscles, but you're more at the ready. Those are the basics. You know, strong heart, longer life, we've heard that. It's true. There's, there's a lot of truth to that. Skeletal system. We talked about this one. Provides a rigid framework, especially in the compression, right? But we also have a lot of pulling that goes on with it. A lot of pulling that goes on with it. Um, gravity is the most obvious that the skeleton resists, but movement exercise affects the skeletal system by promoting stronger bones following Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law is just this. Bone grows according to the stress placed upon it. If gravity increased, all our bone density would increase. If you become an astronaut and you stay up there for a while, guess what? You have osteoporosis. Congratulations. You need gravity. You need gravity. Wolf's Law is always in, at work. So if you have one area of the body or one side that's encountering more stress and the other side that's encountering less, then you're going to have lopsided bone growth. One side's going to be stronger or broken down, degenerated, have bone growth all over the place. It's going to look like a mess. The other side will just get lighter, probably osteoporotic, weaker, stronger, or weaker, mangled, stronger, something like that. Lymphatic system. The system helps eliminate waste. It's kind of like veins, so you know, arteries go away from the heart, veins come back. We have another system of tubes that goes from all the muscles and the spaces in between where all the fuzz grows, and it collects it, and it's a channel system to get it right back to the heart and out the body. So it pumps through the heart, and then it becomes waste and filtered through by the kidneys and the digestive system. So, um, Whenever we move and exercise, we pump the gunk. So basically, if I flex a muscle, it pushes down on these tubes, and they all have one-way valves. So it only goes one way, out of the body. So the more you move, the more it pumps, pumps the gunk, you get it out, you do better. That includes inflammation, anytime you have like an area that's just kind of gunky, swollen, when you get sore, all that has to come out. It will come out through the lymph system. Um, it also creates uh, heat to um, uh, increase immune, s um, sorry, movement and exercise increases heat, but the lymph system has all the lymph nodes, so when you get sick, they get swollen. It's because it has all the white blood cells that kill all the invaders in there. So when you move a lot, when you exercise, even when you're sick, which a lot of people tell you not to, you actually increase heat, and when you increase heat, the efficiency of every cell in your body gets boosted. So guess what? Your immunity goes up because they become way more powerful and way more efficient. Movement and exercise keeps you healthy. Endocrine system. Hormones. It's just our hormone system. Delivery system. It's another communication system. Nerves send signals to places to tell it what to do. Nerves also tell the glands to release hormones to send signals through the blood to tell it what to do. Anybody get scared? Feel adrenaline? It's delivery of a, it's another message, but it boosts the efficiency of your body like that. It's a hormone. So, moon and exercise, obviously, it's going to work simultaneously with the uh, circulatory system to deliver all these hormones. And it's going to do it better through movement and exercise because you have better blood flow. Um, so, it's going to ensure that swift delivery because of that. Um, promote the healthy execution of the signals of the hormones because if your body is moving all the time, working all the time, there's no restriction and everything's at the ready, then anytime it gets a signal, it goes, hey, sure, I'll carry it out, no problem. There's nothing holding me back. I'll just do it. It's efficient, it's efficient, it's efficient. Deliver healthy nutrients to the glands. So if you have good circulation, then it can feed the glands. And that comes from, again, healthy movement. You have to move. Renal system. Think about it. Everybody knows what the renal system is. Movement and exercise uh, affects the renal system, promotes healthy blood flow to the kidneys. So more blood in so it can get filtered better. Strengthening the pelvic floor muscles. So a lot of the exercise actually strengthen the muscle on the base, which is your bladder sits above it. So if that pelvic floor is very strong because you're active, then it helps you hold it. Less problems holding it. Makes sense, right? It's a muscle. Pulmonary system. You're going to increase breath rate. You know, you're going to breathe harder. You're going to breathe faster. With it, you're going to expand your rib cage. The more you practice that, the easier it becomes to breathe. The easier you breathe, the more easily you can get a lot of the nutrients and the oxygen into your body, as well as the carbon dioxide out, all the gunk out, the goods in. Integumentary system, your skin. But 
you need healthy blood flow. If you have skin diseases and you're not getting blood flow because nothing's working or it's not moving and you have fuzz right under your skin so your skin doesn't even slide, you're going to have all sorts of problems. Think about it. If you got fuzz going on, you might have more wrinkles, might get less nutrients, might have more skin problems. Think about this, if you're getting poor blood flow and you need nutrients to create resistance to things like the sun, then the less you move, the more you burn in the sun. I mean, just track this. Movement has just a global effect on our bodies. Digestive system keeps you regular. No joke. Move around. Because the food needs to move through a track. The more you move, the more you create an opportunity for it to slip and slide the way it needs to slip and slide. You don't have to think about it. <laughs> Promotes healthy, healthy blood flow to the gut. That means you absorb more nutrients. Again, it goes back to the circulatory system, but the circulatory system you can voluntarily change by the way you move and the way you interact. Reproductive system, this one's fun, right? Gives us the opportunity to experience pleasure and reproduce our species. So movement and exercise helps us reproduce, obviously. Everybody can figure that one out. Making sure the parts work. A lot of means keeps you on the dance floor. I mean, helps with the romance too if you can move well. <laughs> Sweets are off her feet, hopefully into your arms, hopefully not onto the floor. That wouldn't be good. Get your moves on, helps you go for long walks on the beach, gets you in the mood. All these activities come with movement, they're really good. And then once you successfully reproduce, then you need movement in order to keep up with those that you do reproduce. Makes sense. <laughs> Nerve system controls everything. The nerve system controls everything. The nerve system controls every part, coordinates every action, makes sure everything goes where it goes. But when we move, it actually feeds our brain. Movement wakes up our brain. Anybody do some exercise and they're like, oh my gosh, you can think clearly. Has that ever happened before? No. <laughs> no? Sorry. <laughs> Strengthens nerve signals. The more you do something, neuroplasticity, you brought it up, I heard you, right? Neuroplasticity is the more some, a signal gets sent through a nerve, the stronger the signal gets and the more efficient it gets at sending it. So the more you move, the more efficient you are at moving. It just works on itself, it builds on itself. It promotes healthy functions of all other systems because if you have a good working nervous system, all the other systems work. Muscular system, we've been covering that the whole time. So. Keeps your muscle tone, tensegrity. Make sure you have soldiers on the ready. No sleeping soldiers. Keeps the fuzz away. Promotes the function of all other systems, which is the principle we're on. But all muscle is controlled by nerves directly, and anything that's a moving part in your body, including your gut, including the lymph system, including your blood vessels, including your heart, including your lungs, including everything you can think of is controlled by muscles. Moving parts are muscles. You don't have a moving part in a robot unless you have a motor. Why would you have a moving part in a body unless you had a muscle? Hair. Anybody ever get goosebumps? Every hair in your body is controlled by a muscle. Every one. All of them pull. That's why you get it, the hair sticking straight up. It's literally a muscle going and pulls it so it sticks straight up. Every hair on your body literally is controlled by muscles. So, if it's controlled by muscles, what control muscles? Nerves. So the nerve signal has to come from the spinal cord. It comes out, goes to the muscle, and tells it what to do, including every hair on your body, every hair on your head. Well, that nerve comes up, and that nerve in the spinal cord comes from the brain. Comes from the brain, down, through the brain stem, there's some that come directly from the brainstem, go up back towards the head. The rest of them travel down and exit the spinal cord at a certain point as a nerve, telling that muscle at any given point exactly what to do. Okay? It's extremely important. Extremely important. This is why we do what we do. This is why we, Dr. James and I, the Pierces, chiropractors, do what we do. Because we understand that every single system of the body has some moving part. Every moving part is a muscle. There's other parts that are controlled directly by nerves not having to do with a muscle, but we also understand that movement overall is controlled by nerves. So we make sure that the nerve system is clear so that the signal can get from the brain down through the brain stem and actually travel out the spinal cord to the muscle and tell it exactly what to do, when to do it at the right time for the right reasons. 
There's two sides of this story. We're going to go over it. But if you have proper spinal alignment, everything is free and clear. Most of your patients, so you get this. You have proper spinal alignment, you're going to have proper nerve function. There's no interference on there. Brain all the way down to the brain stem, down the spinal cord, out the nerves, to the muscles, a-okay, everything's great. So you have proper functioning tissues, and because of that, you have good health. I don't know why it says proper good health. That was me again. But if you have interference in the nerve system from the brain controlling it, and we're talking about movement here, then you're going to have nerve interference, which means the tissues, the muscles, will not function right, and you won't move right. If you don't move right, then you end up with dis-ease. Think about it. If you have imbalanced movement, if I have a really strong muscle on this side, a really weak one on this side, because the nerve signal on this side is going. I have good tone. This one, not much tone. If I get hit in this leg, most likely it'll be okay. Hit in that one, not so great. If I step on a curb or step wrong here, well, if it's this muscle, hey, everything's at the ready. My soldiers aren't sleeping here. But if I try to step up and miss a step, my soldiers are sleeping. I'm not protected. My joint's wrong. I have dis-ease. Something's wrong in my body. I could not respond correctly to what I encountered because I have sleeping soldiers. There's two sides of it. Maybe, maybe I exercise all the time. Move my body. No fuzz. All my soldiers are awake, I think, because I train. But if you're not getting the signal from the brain down to that muscle, you're trained like your soldiers are awake, but it's actually still asleep. Don't want sleeping soldiers. You understand which one's your responsibility? You can move your body, but you also want to make sure that the signals are getting through so there's both sides going on the right way. When we get disease, we get symptoms. Anybody been to the class have seen this chart before? We go to the doctor when this happens. What does the doctor do? Oh, you ripped a ligament. Let's heal the ligament. Did they fix the problem? Like, let's say I did step, twist my knee. I have a problem with my knee now. My knee hurts. Doc, my knee hurts. Well, what's the problem? I stepped on something, twisted. Why did it twist? It's not important. Your knee hurts. Let's take care of the knee. All right? That's that's the reaction. Let's give it anti-inflammatory. How about a pain pill? Something. You're dealing with the symptoms. Maybe you tear something. Let's reconstruct it. Let's take it from a disease to maybe more of an ease because at least there's a part there. But what's the problem? You have sleeping soldiers because you have interference. So do you think it might happen again? Surgery, 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 surgery. I don't know why I re-injured it. Why did I re-injure it? Maybe just the weak tissue. Well, it's not like, it's not the ligament. You're sleeping soldiers, nothing's at the ready. You got fuzz all over, restrictions, you can't move. It's not working. So this is what we do. We've talked about this, and if you've been patients, but it's, it's always good to review this. We use the, the sound wave adjusting in order to correct the atlas. The reason why we do that is because we know that when we have a misalignment of the top bone of the neck, it does put pressure on the nerves. If it puts pressure on the nerves, it will interfere in that nerve signal, and you will have an imbalance, which is why we check leg length. It's the most apparent thing. It's because that nerve goes directly to the muscles of the back, twisting the pelvis, making one leg appear short every time. As soon as you take the pressure off the nerves, balance. You got soldiers at the ready. It's not magic. It's not magic. So as soon as you can get that corrected, um, it really does clear. You all know we, or most of you know, we actually we do take the three-dimensional x-rays. That way we know exactly where that bone is in space. We measure it specifically to find out where it is down to a hundredth of a degree for a reason. We're particular for a reason. Because we know that if we can correct that the right way, everything's at the ready, you can move. From that point on, you can get your soldiers at the ready, your muscles toned, right? You can get rid of the fuzz, and you can experience the longevity and the vitality of having all the f functions of your body work properly through the movement that you engage in. Once we get the measurements, we adjust the atlas. And because of the specificity, you do hold it. Because just like the muscles being ready in the rest of your body, once the signals go to the muscles of the neck, the neck muscles are at the ready. They do have to train. They do have to get toned. 
at least the signal's working here. And slowly, you start gaining strength and stability over time because your soldiers become more at the ready here. So everything I'm talking about also pertains to you getting more out of your care. For those of you who are patients, if you understand these principles, where do we start? For those of you who are patients, we started with, uh, when you start care, it's for right now, don't move. Keep very limited movement. Lock it in, all right? Why are you locking it in? Because rest in the beginning is more powerful. Get your soldiers at the ready on the intrinsic level. Make sure the brains are, brain signals are going down the nerves to the muscles and coordinating to them so they're balanced. You've been doing things, you might have a slight imbalance of the muscles, but it'll really start getting it in there. Then what's your job? Start moving, but there's an order to it. We tend to jump categories of movements. We don't start with the basics, and we're not honest with where we're at. So I broke this up into three categories, breaking up just basic movements that we're all familiar with. We're getting really close to being done, so I just want to kind of categorize this, but you'll understand this really well. I broke these movements up into three. Fundamental movements, interactive movements, recreational movements. Fundamental movements are the things we start with as a kid. Move your own body. What's the first thing a child does when they start moving, uh, other than flail? And roll. Mm -hmm. Crawl. Crawl. They crawl. Crawling. How many people have babies or have been around babies that can outcrawl them? <laughs> that can outcrawl them. So, I mean, seriously, like a six month old outdoes us most of the time. <laughs> and that's our starting point. That's where we should be able to thrive because that's where we started. Then what do we do? We walk, right? Fundamental movements, very simple. Move ourselves across the earth. Don't worry about anything around us, just move ourselves. Are we good at it? Are we okay with walking? Can you walk? I mean, we should be able to walk miles, no problem. Just do, 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 do. Think about it, a kid, even when they first start walking, they could walk clear across the whole mall and then they crash, they go to sleep. And it's hard for some of us. And we run, we run, run, run. Obviously this is an extreme example, but we run. You know, and we should be able to continue running. Running should be easy. It's moving ourselves across the earth. We jump. This is extreme, obviously, but even just simple jumping. Sometimes it's hard for us to get off the ground. Way too much fuzz and no soldiers at the ready. Too restricted to even jump. It's simple. It's just moving across. Hey, there's a stone. Jump. Maybe we should start here. Climbing. Again, extreme, but just climbing up simple things. Sometimes it's just, I can't do it, or it's way too hard. Climbing should not be a problem. Swimming. Swimming is a little easier because it takes pressure off. Once you see that smile on someone's face, because they realize, I can get going myself. It's, it's the greatest moment when it comes to that kind of training. So let's dive in a little bit, okay? We have a lot of information to go over, but I want you to know all of this is about principles. So don't feel any pressure to follow a method because I'm not giving you any today. You get to select the method because you'll be more informed. So what is being said about exercise? And this is a very interactive class. Some of its questions, some of its stories, some of its information. But what have you heard about exercise? And by that I mean what have you heard that exercise is good for and how should you do it? And just little blips of Prolonged things. Your life. Prolongs your life. Absolutely. What else? Feel better. Feel better. In many ways, yeah, absolutely. Lose weight. Lose weight. Yep. Absolutely. You should do it so many times a day, not so many times a week, it's for so long. It's hard to what have you heard? Everything. What's an example? Um, I hear sometimes at least 10 minutes or 30 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. uh, then I hear sometimes three to five times a week. Yeah. Uh, the story's very quiet. Yeah. Has that, anybody else heard that? Numbers similar to that? An hour. Yeah. An hour, yeah, an hour a day. And it, what else? What else is exercise good for? Overall well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Stress reliever. Stress reliever. It can be. It really can. What's that? It helps you sleep. It does, yeah, yeah. 
I hear it a lot, and I, I personally would say it's true. Absolutely. Any others? What about other recommendations? What have you heard other than just time frame? Mix of cardio and strength training. That's really common, right? Has everybody heard that? Mm -hmm. What else? Warm up, cool down, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Warm up's important in the beginning. It's important to cool down afterwards. Everybody hear that one? Okay. Exercise really intense in the middle, right? What else? Welcome. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any others? I have heard that. <laughs> I was in the army for a while. That, I think that was almost, was that a slogan for a little bit? No, it was pain is weakness leaving the body. Unless pain lasts 20 years and then it's weakness creeping in, isn't it? like that saying. I don't think a lot of people like that saying. <laughs> Those are great. So I put together a couple. Who's been to the Health Fundamentals class? Real quick, by a show of hands. You have, do you remember fixed ideas? I know you guys have. No. Fixed ideas? Do you remember fixed ideas? Mm -hmm. Paradigms, we talked yeah. about that. So I, I wrote a couple fixed ideas about um, movement and exercise. Let's see what matched up and, and what didn't. Most of them probably did. I think you had most of them. Exercise is important to burn calories. Also weight, you know, we always talk about those hand in hand. Exercise keeps your heart healthy. Would everybody agree they've heard that at least somewhere? Exercise will get you fit, obviously. Exercise is important to lose weight. We talked about that. Work out at least three times a week. You talked about that. I didn't put the time in. I should put the time in. <laughs> I have heard 30 minutes, an hour. I've heard 10 minutes, and then if you want to do six minute abs, and somehow in six minutes, a couple times a week, you'll just have these like <laughs> washboard abs. I don't know how it happens. <laughs> Maybe you never eat, and it's just exactly. bo <laughs> the bone sticking out. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> Um, stay, stay in a target heart rate. Has anybody heard that one? Some, you have to work out in a target heart rate. Um, ask your doctor before exercising. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they just say you should exercise. It's here, it's here, there, hit or miss. I actually went online and all I did is Google exercise. I wanted to see the first listings that came up. And actually, I was surprised. Um, PubMed was one of them and WebMD was I think first. And WebMD would say, all exercise is good for you. And it was basically saying a lot of things we said, but it basically said, go do it, it'll help your life. And then they said, here's some suggestions on what you can do, and they went right to the methods. So benefits, methods, no principles. I looked on Wikipedia, definition, benefits, some methods that people follow, Wikipedia had more closer to principles. They were they were closer, um, and then there was a couple other ones on the top, um, but they were very very similar. So unfortunately, we are bombarded with these advertisements about what exercise and movement are good for, um, and how to do them before we understand how the body works and therefore how to choose correctly. And again, by choosing, I don't necessarily mean do I join Gold's Gym or LA Fitness. I'm not talking about these kind of choices, okay? So, let's move on. Why do we exercise? I'm calling this one, I'm coining this by the way, tonight, the 60-30 conundrum. And you named it, okay? Unfortunately, by the way, all these things are supposed to be hidden and I had a Mac computer, tried to put it on the internet, play it through the internet. It took away all my transitions, so it would have been cool and moving around, and whatever. We're going to deal with it. So here's the 60-30 conundrum. On average, what we see today is that this right here, sitting, is about 16 hours of our day. Think about it. You wake up, you walk to the bathroom. You might need to sit down in the bathroom, <laughs> but you get up, you go eat breakfast, you sit down. You make your coffee, you make your breakfast, you might be up a little in the kitchen, and you get ready to go to work. Yes, time to get moving, <gasps> right to the car, and sit. Driving to work, driving to work. You get out of the car, maybe you have a flight of steps. Hey, there we go, I have my exercise of the day. <laughs> you get up the flight of steps, you go, I'm at work, great, there we go. 
sit, 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 sit. Lunch break comes. You're like, finally, a break from this. Finally, I'm exhausted. Ugh, I think I'm going to sit for a second. I don't, it's funny that we get exhausted at lunch when we've been sitting all day. We, we get up from lunch, and we go right back, and we sit. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cubicle. We have driving jobs. There's very little moving jobs. If you think about it, there's very little physical labor jobs left. So we sit, 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 sit. We go, I'm off of work. Finally, I'm going to go. You run down the steps, exercise for the day, breathing hard, get in the car, and then you sit and you drive home. And you get home, what do we do? Oh my gosh, I'm so exhausted. I think I'm going to sit for a second. <laughs> and you turn on the tube. And then we watch some shows. Now, it's easier when you have kids because you have to chase them. You're forced into exercise whether you like it or not. But it's very easy to just get in a pattern of sitting, 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 sitting. Quick movement, sitting, sitting, sitting. And then here's the thing. You, you nailed this perfectly. We go, I'm going to be a healthy person. So what do I do? Maybe 30 minutes, maybe five times a week, 30 minutes a day, you exercise. And that's considered activity. You are an active person at that point, and you defy the odds. You defy the odds with 30 minutes of activity. Think about the rest of the world, or go back in America 100 years. Just 100 years. OK, I wake up. Got to get moving. You might sit for breakfast. Make breakfast, then you might sit, take a break. Enjoy it with your family. And what do you do? Get going. And you go. And you go. And you work. There are no sedentary jobs. Nothing. You move and move and move and move. Lunchtime comes. What do you do? Oh, I'm exhausted. Thankfully, I can sit for a change. I'm going to enjoy this. You eat. And once you're done resting, you keep going. And go and go and go. You get home, there's chores. Not everything is automated. We have Roombas now. Seriously, we have Roombas. It's ridiculous. We don't even vacuum our own floors. A robot does. <laughs> so here's the 60-30 on the flip side. 16 hours a day around, you're moving. 30 minutes, you're sitting. But the funny thing is, is we consider that an active person today. Anybody getting a little light bulb real quick? <laughs> So that's the conundrum we're living in right here. If, 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 that's how we lived a long time ago, and if there's principles that kind of define the way human movement and exercise as we define it now, um, if those things are run by principles, then there should be human examples of it going right. There should be. Because if, if we're living in this conundrum, then we're not seeing it. And if I pull statistics on America, nothing will show the real story of the principles because we're defying the principles and we're barely getting along. So I pulled an article, and this is my absolute favorite article of all time. Absolute favorite one. National Geographic, 1973. This gentleman here, 108 years old, this is the article right here, Search for the Oldest People. In this article, there was a scientist. He, is, uh, he studied longevity, so basically old, old, old people. He wanted to go around the world, find the oldest people that would live, cultures that tended to live older. So not just a person, but whole cultures that, as a whole, they all just advance, advance, advance in age healthily. So he went around the world and he went to three main spots. One was Ecuador in the Andes Mountains. One was the Caucasus Mountains in the country of Georgia. That's uh, near the Soviet Union, old Soviet Union. And he went to uh, Afghanistan to the Hunza area, um, but it was a little north of India. These three areas tended to be the oldest people. And he found, this is Ecuador, he found this gentleman. I love this. O to be 108 again. <laughs> um, this gentleman, it says this, once a hunter who roamed the Andean hills, Carpio retired from the arduous pursuit of fif uh, pursuit 50 years ago and took up farming. He's now, in this picture, 123. Does that look like a 123-year-old man? Body, it tends to feel a little bit better, but we should be able to swim easily and freely. These are fundamental movements, things that help us get across the earth, just move 
with what we encounter. We should be able to move at least our own body. If you can't do that, this is a good place to start. Work on these. Stay in the category of fundamental movements until these become easy. Then we move on. Recreational movements, pushing. We should be able to push objects, things that we encounter. We should be able to just, you know, get our body ready and move it instead of it hurting us. It, it's usually not jumping out at us unless it's like a football player or something like that. Pulling, again, I can push something, I can pull something. I should be able to brace myself and move an object, right? Carrying, we pick things up. Obviously, this usually starts very early with little objects, but we should be able to carry. We should have strength in our body and coordination to move objects around. Lifting, it starts with our kids. You know, we, all, we lift kids all the time. You know, sometimes though we're so restricted, we just have certain patterns that we can get there, but we're really not efficient. We might be breaking down because we're not really at the ready. You know, we're not there yet. Throwing, we should be able to take an object and just lob it. We're talking about that. You should be able to train this whole um, anatomy train so that you can wind up and chuck something without it hurting you. Kicking, kick things. But these are interactive movements. Does everyone understand this? So first I move me, then I move stuff. Then I go to recreational movements and then I can start interacting a little bit more with gear and equipment and things that are a little more complicated, but I can do it without it hurting me because I'm coordinated, because I can move me and objects, now I can do it dynamically. I can start piecing it together. And anytime you get into a recreational movement, cycling, weightlifting, surfing, we have kayaking, skiing or snowboarding, um, and sports, Usually these things come with training periods where you go, I gotta get used to the gear, I gotta get used to the terrain, I gotta get used to the environment around me. And as these things start meshing together, I can do crazier and crazier things. You end up doing things that are just insane. But you never see a rugby player, at least one that really gets it, gets these principles. Whether they can say them or not, they have a concept of them. They don't go, it's been like five years, I think I'll just go play a professional game real quick. None of them. No coach will put them in. Nobody will do anything. You know why? They're probably fuzzed over. The soldiers aren't at the ready. They're not trained for something like that. They got to get back to the fundamentals. Right? So here's what we have. Fundamental movements, interactive movements, recreational movements. Guess what a weekend warrior is? Someone who can't do that, can't do that, and goes ahead and does that. What does a weekend warrior do? Comes back on Monday, hurt. Why? because they can't move their body, they can't move stuff, but they think they can put it all together. They got fuzz everywhere, they're restricted like crazy, nothing's at the ready, they have a ton of sleeping soldiers all the time, and they go, I used to do that once, and they run out, and they go, bam, oh my gosh, I got hurt, I thought I was ready. You weren't even close. Even a trained athlete, takes a summer off, what does the coach do? Go run. Run, first thing. You don't touch a ball for a week. Hey, now that you're good at running forward, guess what we're gonna do? Run backwards and sideways and diagonal and zigzag all over the place until you are really, really good at moving you. Once you're good at moving you, I might give you a ball or something, whatever the tool or equipment is. I might hand that to you. Guess what we're gonna do? One movement really well. Back and forth, let's say it's soccer. One movement, just stand there, kick it back. Don't argue, just keep going. What are you doing? You're breaking up the fuzz and you're getting your soldiers at the ready, right? Everything's getting toned. Okay, now do something with the back foot. Don't do any of the crazy stuff yet. All right, now we're gonna do a scrimmage, half speed, right? We've heard this before. This is, they know it, they understand these principles. Move you, move stuff, then put it together. Why is it that we think we can go and we just do that? First thing we do, I'm gonna get fit. I'll go join a gym. Maybe I'll do the weight section first. You should probably just use the mat for a while. Move you, move, move you around a little bit more. Weightlifting is maybe closer to this but it can get dynamic, you know what I mean? So I, I, I was careful, I'm putting it here, but we jump, we jump steps, do you understand? So whether you're under care or not, doesn't really matter. 
for, for this concept, but if you start in the right place, you have to be honest about where you are. Be honest with where you are and start there. Get really good at that step. Move to the next one. Get good at that one. And then like an athlete with a good coach, you almost have to coach yourself and say, I'm not crossing this line right here until I got rid of the fuzz and I got my soldiers at the ready. Then I'm gonna go have some fun. And then people tend to really enjoy this when they're not getting hurt. If you take the time, you can enjoy this thoroughly. That's why you have people that have like never run in their life. They, they get really good at that. They maybe train a little bit dynamically. And then you have like a 70 year old who runs their first marathon. It's pretty intense. I mean, it's a, it's a fundamental movement, but it's intense, you know? But they took the time. They go, I'm gonna enjoy every step of this. I'm going to take the time it needs to take away 20 years of fuzz. Do you understand? Okay. So here it is. Your three health fundamentals for exercise and movement. Keep your soldiers at the ready. Make sure that, oops, make sure that when you exercise, you are really building tone. It's not about the fat. It's not about the calories. It's not about the whatever. Because those things will always be a byproduct of you moving well. Always. But think about what will get everything just nice and tight. Not, uh, not just the looks, because you can start and you can get things tight before it looks like it's tight. And then the byproduct of things being tight and loose from the fuzz will be that you can easily shed everything else. Everything starts functioning well and the parts keep working for your whole life. So I'm going to end with this. BJ Palmer, founder of chiropractic, developer of foot chiropractic. Uh, his father was a founder, actually. Um, you never know how far reaching uh, something you think, say, or do today will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. I'm sharing this information with you so you can share it with others. I tried to make it simple so that you can make it clear to a friend. And you guys have also been, a lot of you have been under care, some maybe not. Um, we want what we do with these classes and what we do with this care to be as far reaching in this community as possible. And we ask each and every one of you to participate as much as possible. If you have a nugget of information that'll help someone's health, help someone's life, share it. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna share something with you. We actually are gonna give you guys, uh, just like the health restoration class, we decided that we would actually give each and every one of you a certificate for a free consultant exam. A lot of you are patients, I understand that. So you've been helped. Help a friend. The whole community can change when we get the right information out and the right steps are taken in the right order to restore what's been lost. We're dedicated to it, both in what we say and what we do. These classes we're offering for free because we believe that it's gonna change the community and we will keep going. I'm persistent. I will keep going. <laughs> I'm really persistent. <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> but I know that it'll change many of your lives. I do want to thank you all for coming. Um, that is the end of the class. I really appreciate every single one of your time that, uh, that you put aside to come to this class. Because I really think that if you start to think about it and apply it and are honest about where you are, you can take some steps that will completely change the way you experience life. Um, I do have announcements up here. These are the classes coming up. If you'd like to, there's a sign-up sheet for the next one. It's the Health Fundamentals class on nutrition, an apple a day, nutritional principles to keep the doctor away. Um, feel free to invite a friend, invite family. It doesn't really matter. It's an open class. It is easier if you do sign up. Uh, but that's on the front desk as you leave. And then Dr. James and I will be here to answer any questions you might have after the class. But again, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.